Stay back. Human Thank by Michael Franti and Spearhead. Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We continue our program with the crisis in Syria. Thousands of people have died in what is likely the Arab Spring's bloodiest conflict to date. Syrian opposition activists said today that two Western journalists had been killed in the city of Homs, French photographer Rémi Ochlik and Marie Colvin of the Sunday Times. Shells reportedly hit the building they were staying in, which is believed to be a makeshift media center or medical clinic. This BBC video shows what is believed to be Marie Colvin's last report. I mean, just today, shelling started at 6.30 in the morning. I counted 14 shells hitting this civil, just this civilian area, Baba Lama, within 30 seconds. Um, there's a small clinic. Uh, you can't really call it a clinic. It's a, an apartment um, that has been turned into a clinic. I mean, you have plasma bags hanging from coat hangers. Um, there was just a constant stream of civilians. I watched a little baby die today. Absolutely horrific. That was Marie Colvin of the Sunday Times in a BBC News video, thought to be her last report from Homs. A citizen journalist was also reportedly killed in Homs yesterday. Rami Al Sayed provided live video streams and posted more than 800 videos on YouTube under the name Syria Pioneer. Meanwhile, Syrian activists say Assad's forces killed more than 60 people in attacks on villages in Homs yesterday. Syrian forces also opened fire earlier this week on demonstrators in Damascus. With estimates of well over 5,000 deaths in Syria, the shocking toll has sparked ongoing calls for international intervention to stop the bloodshed. Speaking yesterday in Jerusalem, Republican Congressman John McCain of Arizona told reporters that the U.S. should employ every option available to assist the Syrian resistance. We can use the lessons of the past, the, and we can work with a contact group, we can work with Turkey, we can work with the Arab League, which has played a lead role, and provide what's necessary to the Syrian resistance. Now, the pushback you'll hear, well, we don't know who they are, we don't know, uh, we don't know who to identify, how do we do it. There are ways to help people that are fighting for freedom and are willing to give up their lives in behalf of it. Pardon me? Such as. Such as there are ways to get weapons to people who are fighting against uh, this kind of repression. We showed that in Libya. There are ways to, first of all, by giving them the moral support that they deserve. I'm a little embarrassed that a lot of the world has not spoken up more strongly on their behalf. Arizona Senator John McCain. Meanwhile, State Department spokesperson Victoria Newland told reporters yesterday that the United States still believes a political solution would be the best outcome in Syria. However, Newland noted that additional measures might be considered if Assad's regime doesn't yield to pressure. We still have a chance for a political solution. We still have a chance to get to the kind of transition scenario that the Arab League has laid out and that many of the Syrian groups support. So from our perspective, uh, we don't believe that it makes sense to contribute now to the further <clears throat> militarization of Syria. What we don't want to see is the spiral of violence increase. Uh, that said, if we can't get Assad to yield to the pressure that we are all bringing to bear, we may have to consider additional measures. This Friday, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton will meet representatives of some 70 countries in Tunis for the first Friends of Syria meeting to coordinate possible next steps. The 22-member Arab League has endorsed the meeting, and the U.S., European Union and Russia are among those invited to attend. <clears throat> However, Russia has declined the offer and yesterday joined with China and Iran in renewing its declaration of support for the Syrian government. Earlier this month, Russia and China vetoed a Security Council resolution condemning President Bashar al-Assad's regime crackdown. The U.N. General Secretary, the U.N. General Assembly, passed a measure with similar language just last week. For a debate on the merits and pitfalls of the foreign intervention, we are joined by two guests. In Norman, Oklahoma, we're joined by Joshua Landis, the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. He writes Syria Comment, a daily online newsletter on Syrian politics. And via Democracy Now! video stream, we're joined by Karam Nasher, a cyber activist who's working with Syrian protesters via social media platforms, a Ph.D. candidate at Princeton University in the History Department specializing in modern Middle East. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Professor Landis, let's begin with you. You've heard the State Department uh, saying they're weighing intervention. Uh, 
Talk about the significance, what this would mean, and why you're opposed to it. Well, I'm not opposed to, uh, to helping the opposition. The, the problem right now, the dangers right now with arming the opposition is that we're not sure who to arm. There's the SNC, which is the political umbrella group, with which um, Clinton will be meeting in Tunisia shortly. They are, have just reappointed a leader, a French professor, for another two months, but they can't agree who should lead the, the group, except for uh, these two months and three month intervals. There's, there's clearly a lot of um, turmoil in the leadership. The Syrian, the free Syrian army that uh, is led by a colonel in Turkey just called the SNC a bunch of traitors a week ago on BBC News. And then there are dozens of little militias in Syria that have emerged and are forming part of this very potent opposition. The question is, who, which one of those militias should America be arming? And uh, the, the danger is that if you jump in early and try to pick a winner, um, then you might end up later on with supporting uh, an opposition group that doesn't turn out to be the winner when uh, the dust begins to settle on this revolution. Joshua Landis, there, there's some speculation that, in fact, um, uh, the opposition is already being uh, funded by the U.S. Is that correct? I don't know if it's being funded by the U.S. It's possible that they're getting aid, intelligence. There have been reports of drones flying over Syria and so forth. And uh, there is undoubtedly some assistance. There have been satellite phones, communication efforts. You know, intelligence has been playing a role. But it's probably getting funded by Qatar, Saudi Arabia, other groups. Turkey is clearly helping the Free Syrian Army to a, a limited extent. But people have not jumped in. The Syrian opposition is starved for arms. They're starved for money. Uh, you know, the foreign sanctions have devastated the Syrian economy. And that hurts the government, but it hurts the people even more. It's the poorest and the weakest who are most hurt by sanctions. And that means they can't fund the revolution. They can't feed their families. Syria needs hundreds of millions of dollars. They need lots of heavy arms. The Syrian army still has tanks, it has helicopters and potentially airplanes if it should move in that direction. But uh, this Syrian opposition is going to need lots of heavy arms, training, central command and control. Uh, this is a major effort. And people, you know, foreigners, are in disagreement. They've gone to the UN, they've gone to the Arab League, they've gone to Turkey. Nobody wants to get in charge of this opposition. It's a you-first situation. We saw what happened in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. America is exhausted with taking the lead in regime change in the Middle East, and it's hanging back. Now, we've got a lot of rhetoric, as we heard from Senator McCain and we've heard from others, calling Assad a terrible dictator, and, and, uh, but very little action on the ground. The opposition still needs monstrous amount of aid that people are quite reluctant to step up to the plate and give. Karam Nashar, your position on intervention in Syria. Well, uh, to start with, I, I disagree with uh, Professor Landis's um, uh, portrayal of the situation with the Syrian opposition. Uh, it is true that, for instance, in the Syrian National Council, uh, there are a lot of uh, disagreements, but most of this turmoil, most of these problems stem from the fact that uh, the base of the Syrian revolution, the protesters, the demonstrators, and the activists inside and outside the country are still uh, uh, frustrated with the leadership of the Syrian National Council because of its inability to solicit more international support. And so uh, international support or international community uh, should not be deterred uh, by the problems that the Syrian National Council is facing at the moment. In fact, if there's more enthusiasm, if there's more support, if there's more unequivocal uh, support for the Syrian protesters, first and foremost, if there's more empathy uh, to the quagmire the Syrian uh, uh, people find themselves in, uh, I think that would actually reflect positively uh, on the unity of the, of the Syrian opposition. And I believe that the State Department, uh, Secretary Clinton, and the American administration uh, is heading towards that. They, they're, they're realizing that empowering the opposition would actually help it um, uh, uh, consolidate itself, consolidate its position, um, uh, and, and, and present a united front not only to the people inside, uh, but also to the international, to the international community. So there's a there's a there's a there's a difference here. Um, obviously, the ideal is not the situation is not ideal. Um, we've wanted to do this on our own, and I speak here not just as a cyber activist. I'm a member of the local coordination committees, uh, one of three uh, bodies of the grassroots movement that uh, started on uh, March 15, uh, 2011. 
And we've been, we've, we, we hoped for uh, around eight months that we were going to be able to replicate the Tahrir Square moment. Uh, people said we want a peaceful, peaceful movement. We want change to come from within. Uh, but uh, uh, the main factor here was, in fact, regime brutality, the intensification of, of, of uh, 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 repression, of brutality, of killing. We moved from using live ammunition and, and, and firing randomly at demonstrators to rolling in tanks into entire cities to random shelling of entire residential neighborhoods, something which we still see for the, for, for, for the past 18 days um, uh, in the city of Homs. And so while I do uh, realize that liberals around the world in particular are very wary of a replication of the Iraq scenario, for instance, the world, I think, should know that this is not Iraq. This is a society that has been mobilizing against the regime for the past year. There's a, there's a, there's a humanitarian uh, disaster unfolding on the ground. There's a, a moral responsibility to protect the Syrian people. This is not a perfect situation. It's complicated. It's going to require a lot a lot of money and a lot of courage and a lot of uh, 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 involvement on the part of the international community. Uh, but I think uh, the situation, the I'm sorry, the, the Friends of Syria group in Tunisia, uh, the, the upcoming meeting is a step on the right direction. Um, and uh, I think uh, the Arab League and the, the, in Turkey should lead the efforts uh, to help in uh, to help in channel some kind of support uh, uh, from the United States, from uh, the Europeans into the Syrian, uh, the Syrian opposition. The Syrian opposition has made several attempts to present a united front, but their problems today are not uh, uh, the result of some innate inability to uh, unite, but actually as a result of their inability to get more international help. It, help and support will actually solve the problem of the Syrian opposition. It is also Mishar, not sorry, Can I just interrupt you briefly to ask you, Who's in the Syrian National Council? Is it an umbrella group of opposition uh, uh, groups in Syria? Uh, just say a little bit about uh, what makes up the group, Who, who's involved. Well, thank you for this question, because uh, a lot of American um, uh, uh, listeners and viewers are also thinking uh, maybe that the Syrian National Council is some kind of a replica of the Iraqi uh, 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 opposition uh, before 2003, uh, the, the Iraqi opposition that was based in exile. This is completely uh, false. Um, uh, it is true that uh, certain uh, members, uh, certain uh, groups, so it is an umbrella organization. Uh, it includes uh, more than eight different, uh, eight different political groupings. Uh, uh, three or four of these groupings uh, are basically uh, 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 Syrian political parties that have been based uh, in exile or uh, uh, have always been uh, in exile since, uh, um, I think, the late, uh, eight, the late 70s, the early 80s. Um, uh, the most prominent uh, political group of, of, of these would be uh, the Muslim Brothers. Um, but there are also political groups that are based inside the country that actually sent delegates and members to the Syrian National Council from inside. This includes uh, the local coordination committees, the umbrella organization uh, 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 that, I'm, that I'm a member of. It's a grassroots movement that was, that was formed in the first month of the revolution. It includes two other groups uh, uh, that are basically active on the ground among, among uh, uh, the young, the young uh, demographic, the young uh, demonstrators and protesters. Uh, one is called uh, the General Committee for the Syrian Revolution. Uh, another is called the Supreme Council of the Syrian Revolution. Now, why we have all these different bodies? Because the situation on the ground doesn't really help people to communicate with one another. And so these bodies emerge, and now we have these three main grassroots uh, grassroot organizations. The fourth body, which is also extremely key, is the Damascus Declaration. This is a, an opposition group that was formed inside the country. It was uh, officially promulgated in 2005. Most of the members of the Damascus Declaration are based inside. They live in hiding, underground. Uh, 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 um, some members are veteran opposition figures uh, who have always lived inside the country and have always tried to get peaceful, gradual change and believe that Bashar Assad could at some point deliver this. Um, they obviously lost hope long before the beginning of the revolution. And as a result of the revolution, they decided to join ranks with some of the figures outside. I want to bring Professor Joshua Landis back into this. So here we have Karam Nishar laying out who the opposition is, that in fact they're attempting to work together. Uh, your response. And can you also bring Libya into this discussion in the sense of the lessons learned from Libya? Well, I mean, I, as we heard, this is an, this is an opposition which has extremely courageous, it's grassroots, it's, it's coming up from the bottom up, but it's largely leaderless. There is a Syria, the, the Syrian National Council has spearheaded the attempt to get foreign aid and has been very good at it, in fact. They've gotten pretty devastating sanctions put on Syria. 
they mobilized, mobilized the international community. But they're still extremely divided. This was the beginning of a revolutionary process. If America wants to give arms and uh, give money to the Syrian opposition, it's unclear to whom to give it. it. We're not really sure if anybody is really giving orders. Mostly, what we believe is that local groups on the village and neighborhood level have emerged. They're beginning to take up arms, they're beginning to get a command structure, but on the village level, they're not communicating amongst each other that much. At least they're not taking orders from a central, um, a central office. And so America, I think, is a bit confused at this point on where to give the aid, who should they back. And part of sitting down in Tunisia in Friday, on Friday with the Saudis, with the Turks, with the main backers, the Europeans, the main backers of this movement, is to try to come up with some agreement, because the Saudis are going to want to support the more Islamist and perhaps leaning towards Salafist side of this. The Turks are going to want the more liberal Islamists. The Europeans and Americans will want the seculars. And uh, they have to agree who they're going to give the money and the arms to, and who they want to be emerge as the leaders of the new Syria that will be empowered by these hundreds of millions of dollars and weapons that will then, I guess, steer the revolution in one direction or another. And that's, that's the conundrum. And they've been demanding, Sarkozy of France has been demanding that the opposition develop a clear leadership. And just yesterday, the activists were passing around, Syrian activists were passing around a video of, um, of uh, the spokesperson for the Syrian National Council, uh, Khudmani, who had sat down with five Israeli authors in France in a TV show and had said, we need to recognize Israel, the Arabs need Israel, we need peace. This excerpt from an hour-long discussion was taken out, passed around in a viral way, uh, and used to condemn her and condemn the secular leadership of the Syrian National Council by the more Islamists to say, these people are traitors. And uh, this is a kind of squabble that, of course, is going on within the Syrian National Council. And it makes it very difficult for America to decide who, who to back in this uh, revolution. We're going to go to break and come back to this discussion. Professor Joshua Landis is with us from the University of Oklahoma, a Syria expert. We are also joined uh, from Princeton by Karam Nashar, a cyber activist working with Syrian protesters. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We'll be back in, in less than a minute.